Well, this morning, I want to start by um, drawing your attention to the story of Corrie ten Boom. Uh, Corrie was a remarkable godly woman, famous for her and her family secretly housing Jews through World War II and surviving the death camps in Germany. Uh, when I first read of her story, my assumption about Corrie was that after the war was over, that she would stay far from Germany. But that's not the case. That's what a normal person would do, but there was something about Corrie that was exceptional. After the war, she returned to Germany to declare the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. She chose to go on a mission, uh, go on mission in a land desperate for hope and desperate to know the truth of a God who loves people. In one of her books, she tells this remarkable story of sharing the gospel at an event where she spotted one of the guards from the death camps that she was in. This is what she writes. The guard approached me and spoke, Fraulein, will you forgive me? The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust out my hand into the one stretched out to me, and as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then with this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all of my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hands, former guard and former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then, but even then I realised it was not my love I had tried and I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this week I was reminded of this story as I saw someone share it and they added their own title. Corrie Tam Boom, the epitome of a true Christian woman. I agreed with the post. What a remarkable, God-fearing, Christ-loving, resilient, godly woman. But here's the question. What do I mean by that? What does it mean when someone points to someone else and says, what a godly woman you are? Defining biblical womanhood is incredibly important, especially in the light of the cultural moment that we're in, where so much confusion exists around sex and gender. Uh, we're in a series called Being the Bride of Christ, which is uh, looking at a few, a few different ways that we as the church can mature as the church that God has called us to be. In the book of Ephesians, Paul calls the church the bride of Christ. The first week we looked at why we gather, and the second week we looked at what is biblical manhood. And if this is your first week in church, I'm really excited to have you here this morning. You would be well served by jumping onto our YouTube page and catching up with the sermon from last week. It'll probably make a lot more sense to us as we go through this sermon today. But today our topic is really rediscovering biblical womanhood. And I must say that over the last seven days, I've had a particular genuine empathy and concern for the women of City Light East. When I laid out this, uh, this series, I knew that the past seven days would come. I knew that I couldn't do a single sermon on understanding God's design for men and women. It would need to be split over two weeks. So there would be one week where perhaps half of you have clarity and half of you don't. Perhaps for some of you it would look like this. You came to City Light East last week for, for, for perhaps the first time. And what you heard from last week's sermon was that men take up the primary responsibility of providing and protecting and leadership in the home and church eldership. In a way, you heard that men do this and women don't do that. So you felt stuck and maybe a bit deflated. 
Others may say, Carl, you have nothing to worry about. But I put it to you that your understanding of biblical womanhood is going to be served well by recognising even just at the surface level. There are a number of stories being told in our culture today about the role of women that make it particularly challenging for women today. The first of those stories is this this one, that women are inferior to men. This is how Carolyn McCulley, author of Radical Womanhood, um, starts her book. She says, The first time you hear a boy say it, it can sting. You throw like a girl. He screamed just like a girl. That's gross. It's pink. That's girl stuff. The content of these insults usually lacks any serious substance, but the implication is clear. Girls are different, as in worse, inferior. If a boy is lacking skill, strength or speed, he is no better than a girl, she writes. If you're willing to be honest this morning, I think most of us would be willing to admit that to be called a girl is never intended as a compliment. In our culture, it's always meant to put someone down. Recently, the AFL launched a campaign showing tough women with a tagline, play like a girl. And this ad is intended to raise the value of the toughness of women. If you drive around Adelaide now, you'll see large advertisements with the tagline, the power of her, promoting gender equality in light of the upcoming FIFA Women's World Cup. This advertising didn't come from nowhere. It was in response to years of the accepted narrative by many that women are inferior. This is the lived experience of many of the women who are sitting in this room today. The second cultural narrative that we must acknowledge is the impact of feminism. Feminism is usually described as coming in a few waves, and the first wave of feminism has generally been seen as a positive step in our culture. It came around the turn of the 19th and 20th century and it was centred on voting rights. Enabling women to vote meant that they could be greater influences in laws that protected their children from working in harsh factory environments as well as protecting themselves against unfaithful husbands. The first wave of feminism did well to argue that women were not property, they were people of equal value to men. The second wave of feminism came around the 1960s and the fruit of this wave wave is still much uh, debated. At the heart of the movement was the idea that if men and women are truly equal to one another, then they should have equal access to everything, particularly in the areas of economic success and sexual freedom. It was argued that if a man can have sex with many partners and not be looked down upon, then neither should a woman. Pregnancy was seen as the ultimate and unfair barrier to both the sexual expression and economic success of women, so abortion rights was front and centre. Now, the third and fourth waves of feminism that tracked from about the 1990s to now marked a kind of female empowerment. At best, these waves considered how to increase women's opportunities that were predominantly dominated by men, At worst, it put the entire gender of men in the firing line. One of the loudest cries of feminism is a call for the future being a predominantly female-orientated one. To them, the goal of feminism isn't about creating opportunities for women. It is found in women rejecting traditional women's roles and occupying traditional males' roles. Now, within secular movements, there are often good things that are happening. I am grateful for the opportunity that my wife has. My wife works at Cedar College and is able to play a key role in advancing the school's sporting programs. As I grew up in school, I never heard of a female sports teacher, let alone one that was playing a key role in advancing the program within the life of a school. My point isn't that feminism is the enemy, because depending on how you define it, feminism can marry well with scripture. My point is that you do well to know that we are living in a world of competing narratives, each of them telling their own story about what womanhood truly is. Narrative number one, women are inferior and their identity markers are used as ways for men to mock weaknesses in others. Narrative number two, 
women are powerful and the old way of being a woman is both outdated and its mere presence is hurting the cause of all modern day women. Now, I'm sure there's more narratives that we could point to and nuances within those narratives. But today, my, my assignment is to help you consider an alternative narrative, God's story. Friends, in the midst of a world that is shouting new, complex and often polar opposite ideas of what womanhood is, God's word holds firm and his word exists for your good and for his glory. So let me offer a definition of womanhood that I see from the pages of Scripture. Now, as with the definition of biblical manhood that I gave last week, there is more that could be said. This is not an academic definition, but I do think that it gives us the principles in place to understand the major principles, the major landscape of what the Bible is referring to when it speaks of womanhood. So I hope this serves us well this morning. Biblical womanhood is characterised by an eagerness to help and strengthen others, to give and nurture life, and to willing submission in God-given contexts. There's a, there's a lot within that one statement, and so it's best broken into three parts. Here's the first part. Let's look at biblical womanhood as characterised by an eagerness to help and to strengthen to understand the distinctiveness of women, we need to be familiar with her creation in Genesis. In Genesis 2, Moses takes us back to that moment where man exists and woman had not. God saw everything was good except for one thing. Man was not without, man was not without, man was without a suitable companion. This is Genesis 2:18. It says, "Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Then as Adam cast his eye across all creation, nothing that was created was found to be suitable. Verse 20 reads like this. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Adam was made in the image of God, but to flourish in his design, he could not do it alone. Notice that nothing that was made was suitable. The animals were created None suited. Notice that the man was created and it did not suit God to make for Adam another man. Nothing that was created was suitable. So God had to create something distinct from all creation to serve the function that the world lacked, a helpmate for man. So God creates woman. She is suitable. She is the suitable one to provide that which no one else in creation could yet provide. She is a helper fit for the man. So we must ask the question, in what way is she a helper? Well, the word helper that Moses uses is a word that we find throughout the Old Testament. It doesn't have any secret meaning. But something extraordinary is revealed when we notice the context in which it is used. This is Deuteronomy 33, verse 7. It says, And this he said of Judah, Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him into his people. With your hands contend for him, and be a help against his adversaries. This is Psalm 30, verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord, he is our help and our shield. Psalm 70 verse 5 says, But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. If you look up the word help in your Bible, you should be struck by two realities. Here's the first. Help is a word that is commonly used to refer to our Lord. Our God is glad to be referred to as a helper. 
This should free you from any concern that you may feel that to be a helper is somehow less than a vitally significant function. Our God is the God who helps. And God has designed women in such a way that she images God as she helps others. When women bring help to others, she reflects the God who came to Israel, the God who came to David. We also see in the New Testament that when Jesus accomplished his work on the cross to birth the existence of the church, he told the disciples that he would send the helper, the Holy Spirit. Humanity and the church from beginning to this day have only been able to flourish because of the presence and the blessing of great help. We also see here that to help is to provide a contribution of vital strength. When Israel was in trouble, they called out for help from the Lord and their request was specific. They needed the Lord's strength. Now, there are times that I let my children help me bring in shopping from the car. I do this for their benefit, not for mine. Their help makes things harder for me. Things would be easier if they would not help. When one child tries to help with breakfast, it usually means that no one gets to have breakfast and I have to do all the cleaning up. Their their help makes my job harder. The picture of help that we get from the Bible is of a people who without help would be lost. The nation of Israel would be lost. No Messiah would be raised. The people of God would have no comfort and no confidence for ministry without help. Moses, in a few ways, presents Eve to the world as a kind of archetype for women going forward and he points to her divine assignment as helper. And scripture does not have a low view of her role and neither should we. The value of the strengthening help that women bring into the world cannot be overstated. Consider Deborah in the Old Testament, a woman who served as judge in Israel when the men of Israel lacked faith. Consider the women in the New Testament. The first people to share the news of the resurrected Lord Jesus were women. Lydia housed Paul in his missionary journey. Phoebe was known as a godly servant in the church. Priscilla, along with her husband Aquila, helped Apollos understand the reality of the resurrected Jesus. In this church... City Light East is stronger and healthier because of the help of godly women. When women joined our church planning core team, we became stronger. When women put up their hand to serve our church as worship leaders, we became stronger. When women led and joined our discipleship groups, we became stronger. When women came to me to discuss how our church could be a safe place for sufferers of domestic violence, we grew stronger. When a woman came to me and said, I'd like to lead our newcomers ministry, we became stronger. When women offered to run our hands and feet ministry, our children's ministry, our hospitality ministry, we as a City Light East Church became healthier and stronger. City Light East is blessed because biblical womanhood is characterized by an eagerness to help and strengthen others. And we have women in this church who have profoundly answered this call. Next, our definition presents biblical womanhood as characterized by one who gives and nurtures life in God-given contexts. This is Genesis 3 verse 20. It says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living." We saw last week that man has been given the primary responsibility of providing and protecting the well-being of others. Here we see that woman has been given the responsibility of giving and nurturing life. It is a good and beautiful thing. But a couple of things must be said first. Firstly, I agree with Pastor Andrew Green from City Reach West, whose teaching on this topic has influenced much of the teaching here today. He comments that our culture is at risk of being overrun by a devaluing of the role of women in giving and nurturing life. He notices among his people the reaction of women who were asked, who when asked what they do for a living, they respond, I'm just a stay-at-home mum. 
It's in the word just that a kind of lowering of value has occurred. The truth is when women bring life into the world, they are imaging God in a beautiful way. Adam called uh, named the woman Eve as a name of honour for she had a role that he did not. She would bring life into the world and she would mother that life in a unique way and in doing so, she would image God in a way that he could not. The second thing that needs to be said is that I know that the topic of mothering is a difficult topic for some women. I know some single women who would like to be married with children, married women who would like to have children and women who have lost children to miscarriage, which is part of the story of Beck and I. I want you all to have this clearly said to you. Scripture is clear that you do not need to raise a child to powerfully reflect the image of God in this world. I hope you observed that I was careful to add the phrase God-given contexts to the end of our definition. It was added because that is exactly what the Bible teaches. Not every woman will give birth. Not every woman will raise a child. But every woman is able to powerfully image God in this world. And Courtney Reisig, author of The Accidental Feminist, Restoring Our Delight in God's Good Design, says this. When looking at the Old Testament, consider Sarah. She was unable to have children, and even when she was finally able to conceive, she was old and had just one child. She spent the majority of her years childless, yet when we hear her name in the New Testament, we learn that we learn why she was considered a godly woman. Peter praised her not because she gave birth, but because she hoped in God. And consider Eve. God created Eve in his image long before she gave birth. Her distinctiveness as a woman was rooted in the fact that she bore God's image, not just that she could birth a child. Though it is true that only women can give birth, it is not true that it is only through birthing children that women can nurture life. I think we see this design play out naturally in the world. A study through Melbourne University found that over the past 35 years, while women are spending a greater amount of time in the workforce, the jobs they're most attracted to has generally stayed the same. Jobs such as registered nurses, primary school teachers, childcare workers, social workers are all over 80% occupied by women. Now, of course, that's not to say that there aren't other ways for women to nurture life, nor is it saying that these are the only spaces that women should work in. I'm a qualified social worker and have spent 20 years as a helping professional. But even in this small sample size, it's clear and to be celebrated that within the design of women, there is a profound gifting and calling to be someone who cares for and nurtures life. We at City Light East have been profoundly blessed by the way women have nurtured life among our people. When women greeted you on the door, they nurtured life. When women sat beside you in this gathering, they have nurtured life. When a woman stood up here and invited you to a young adults gathering, she was nurturing life. We have women serving in our children's ministry now who are nurturing life. We have women who have opened up their homes and are building into the lives of other people and they are nurturing life. And it is true. When women have children and care deeply for their children, they are imaging God as they nurture life. I'm so grateful for my adoptive mother for imaging God when she chose to adopt me from a deeply drug-addicted woman. I'm grateful for my biological mother who imaged God when she chose not to terminate the pregnancy, but instead offered me up for adoption. I'm sure you too have your own stories, how the women in your life have blessed you through the profound nurturing of your life. It is true that City Light East is blessed because biblical womanhood is characterised by an eagerness to help and strengthen others and to give and nurture life. Uh, Here's the last part of our definition this morning. Submission in God-given contexts. 
Last week, we looked at submission in the life of the church. And today, I want us to get clarity on submission in marriage. Here's Ephesians 5.22. It says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. He goes on in verse 23 and says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. In verse 31, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm referring to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, the reason why submission is a dirty word to many is because some men have used their strength to force women into submission. Members of this church have shared with me of people they know growing up, growing up in churches where it wasn't just normal, but it was encouraged to physically discipline a wife. No doubt this text was used. But the only way you're able to argue for that kind of behaviour is to twist this text to serve ungodly passions. Please note that there is no command in Ephesians 5 for the man to make the woman submit. The command is to the woman that she willingly submit. The command to the man is to lay your life down. The command to the man is to look at the manner in which Jesus served the church and to be that selfless, that loving, that kind and gracious to the wife. And the response of the wife should be, that is the kind of husband it is a delight to submit to. Husbands should be longing to have a wife who could say to her dearest friends, look how much my life is blessed because of the Christ-like leadership of my husband. That is the story the Bible presents of marriage. Um, I remember being in a discipleship group where the culture of the world had infected our discussion. Um, People were speaking about their wives as the old ball and chain, the old battle axe. And husbands were being referred to as the clueless, lazy slob. And though it wasn't me making the comments, I remember not doing anything to stop it. Later, a couple within the group contacted me and rightly called the behaviour to an account. How can we speak about our husbands and our wives so carelessly when our marriages are supposed to reflect something so beautiful and divine? Our marriages are intended to be a shining picture of the gospel. They're supposed to be a powerful reflection of the love of Christ and the powerful submission of the church to our Lord. Friends, guard your tongue when you speak about your partner. God's design is not meaningless. It's intended for your good and for the good of the world and for his glory. We see his glory even in the command of willing submission. As the woman submits to her husband and the husband loves the wife, marriage becomes evangelistic. It becomes discipleship. It causes the world to consider how great the love is of Christ and how available the love of Christ is to the church. So here's our definition this morning. Biblical womanhood is characterised by an eagerness to help and strengthen others, to give and nurture life, and to willing submission in God-given contexts. This world and church is blessed in a profound and beautiful way when the women of this community are eager to help and strengthen others, to give and nurture life, and to willing submission in the various contexts that God provides. So let me finish uh, this morning with a few brief ways that we as a church can protect the vision of Christ-like womanhood in the church. Uh, Here's the first. Men, you must strive to be the kind of servant leaders that God's word calls for. 
It has been suggested by some, none in this church that I know of, but certainly in a broader church, that there is a kind of unfairness that occurs when a church is led by male elders that women miss out. Men receive all the one-on-one discipleship opportunities from the elders, and what results is a gap in discipleship for the women. Here's how I would respond. The one-on-one discipleship of the men in this church by the elders is supposed to be of profound benefit to the women in this church. It's supposed to produce the effect of an army of godly men who love and serve women well beyond the capacity of what a single eldership could do. For example, every fortnight in the evening, I connect with a man from this church to study the word. For what reason do we catch up? Because he asked me if I could help him be a man who would love the word so well that he could serve his wife as Christ served the church. It's clear to me that there would be less concerns over a sense of male bias in the church if what resulted in the discipleship of men wasn't a hoarding of discipleship for themselves to build fat heads, but that there would be a pouring out of love from men to women. Secondly, Older women need to teach younger women. Women play a significant role in building up of younger women. That's what Paul says in Titus chapter 2. The older women are to train up younger women. Now, some women will learn through reading a book, while other women will want to spend time with other women to ask, can you help me apply the gospel into my context? This is a good and beautiful request. I was recently with a younger couple in our church who were talking about an older couple in our church. And the younger wife said to me, I wish I could adopt the other couple as surrogate parents. What a beautiful thing to say. The younger couple looked at an older couple and saw something that they hoped that they could be one day. Let me tell you, older women, whether you're single or married, there is a generation of younger women growing up who need your presence in their lives. The number one criticism I hear in this church from young women is that they wish there was an opportunity to spend more time with older women. Older women, please be the brave ones. Cross the room and see what God can do with your faithfulness. Here's our final point of application to both men and to women. You will not survive our culture's gender war unless you're willing to be a person grounded in the word. You are living in a culture where, depending on who you speak to, gender means far too little or it means far too much. You are living in a time where you are being called by culture to simultaneously affirm that men are the enemy that the future is female and that gender is meaningless. How is, it a po- how is it possible to affirm these contradictions? The truth is you can't. So what can you do? As Paul comes to describe the armour of God in Ephesians 6, the only weapon he describes is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul wants you to see that while you're immersed in this world, you must be immersed in the Word. Um, In 1990, the Hubble telescope was launched into space. It, It was created to give scientists clarity on the deepest parts of space. $400 million it cost. So you can understand how upset the scientists were when the images were all coming back blurry. What was the problem? The lens was faulty. When the lens was being installed, they were buffering it, and in the buffing, they left a smudge on the lens, one fiftieth the size of a human hair. It cost $700 million to fix it. NASA gladly paid the bill because they knew they couldn't make true conclusions about the universe unless they had clarity. We must take care of the lens we are using to see this world if we want true clarity. Getting the right lens 
brings clarity. That's what the word is to the believer. You will not get clarity on biblical manhood or biblical womanhood or the truth and the beauty of Jesus Christ who has come into this world to die for your sins so that you could not just be existing in a religious tradition, but so that you would be called an adopted child of the Father. To get that beautiful truth, you need the correct lens. The lens is the word. And you, my friends, are called to be saturated in it for your good and for his glory. Let's pray together. God, we are asking to be men and women of the word. We know that as we come to your word, we come to know of a God who is um, right in his judgment and pours out 